boy screws loose, they done stripped the bolts on them. Should have never sent them to pick up the work for them. Sprayed the park and had my shit inside the car. Marcus Smart Boy was shooting with a 36 on him. Said if he wasn't in a rush, they was all goners. Tech curse on the all right. Greetings, Chudlings. Welcome to another episode of Chuddy's Corner. It is Valentine's Day. It is Wednesday, February 14th. Uh, it's about 9.30 p.m. The Celtics just wrapped up a 50-point win over the Nets, 136-86 uh, to 86 at the TD Garden. Um, pretty much just domination all the way throughout. Um, I know you're going to cover it a little bit more in your recap. Um, but before we do that, uh, I'm your host, Dugouts. With me is King Chuddy. Chuddy, how you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> I wanted some momentum going uh, into the All-Star break, and I think it's... Can't have a lot better momentum than a nice fifty point win. So oh, yeah. pretty good. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so yeah, we're gonna break down that whole game for you before we do that. Uh make sure that you uh, whatever form uh, whatever platform you're listening to us on, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Uh go to YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube page, uh check out Chuddyscorner.com too. We got a lot of good content there. All all the all the episodes are there, uh, plus a lot of blogs out there too. Um, and you can, of course, leave us a voicemail to be right on, on air. Uh, there's a voicemail tab there you'll see. Um, and a special shout-out to our sponsor, uh, Nick Pereno Real Estate, nickpereno.com. Um, that's all your real estate needs. He's got you covered. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, this ended up uh, – I don't know who P- – Pritchard may have ended up being the high scorer, but I would say for, like, as far as the starter goes, Derek White at 27 points. Tatum Pritchard again. Had, Pritchard at 28. 28, all right, so, so there you go. Yeah. Pritchard clinches the uh, the high score there. Um, Tatum, 20 points, uh, seven rebounds, nine assists. Again, he's just creeping towards that triple-double. Wow, wow. Uh, might have to start he just, played a real amount of minutes. He would have he he gotten it tonight, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, so go ahead. Give us a breakdown of this game. What did you see, Chad? This one was uh, – I know there's not a whole lot of meat and potatoes and a 50-point <laughs> blowout. Yeah. Uh, but if you just give us a little something, what did you see? Yeah, so um, this – I feel like this year it's been kind of easy on those nights to tell where, like, the Celtics just have it and the other team doesn't, and you can sense a blowout early. This might have been the earliest all year. Um, I think we came <laughs> out, Porzingis hit a three, Tatum got right to the line, D. White hit one of his floaters in the lane. It was 7 0, and it was already like, okay, I, I think this might be one of those games. Um, and the Nets, you know, obviously we played them last night in Brooklyn. They battled us, uh, made it very close down the stretch, and had a great shooting night. And a lot of that stuff that they had going last night was not going at all tonight. Uh, they weren't shooting the ball well. Celtics were playing a lot better. We obviously had no Jalen, no Al, but we had Porzingis back in the lineup. Um, and we just kind of jumped on him right out the gate. We picked up almost right where we left off all of the good stuff we kind of built last night. We kept going on this night. Tonight we had Porzingis, too. To, so, I mean, we kept pounding him in the paint. We were dominating him. That was the story of last night's game. Beat him in the paint. Went right back to that. Uh, right out the jump. It wasn't It wasn't really threes at all. It was we were getting right into the lane. We were getting deep post position. We attacked Cam Thomas to the point where they basically had to take him out when he missed a few shots because he was just being unplayable uh, the way we were attacking him. Um And, you know, you saw kind of the best version of the Celtics flying around with defense, rotating, you know, five guys on a string, moving around, not letting the Nets get anything going. Uh, The Nets tonight did not have their hot shooting, and it was just miss after miss. Uh, No second chances. Celtics absolutely dominating the glass and then pushing the ball up the floor. We were getting and going in transition. Um, And, you know, when all of those things fall are working for the Celtics, usually it's only a matter of time until the threes start falling. The threes started falling, and, I mean, that was pretty much all she wrote. It was – just an absolute domination, like you said. Won the first quarter 30 to 15. Um, and it was again just dominant defense, no offense by them. Um, pretty good offense by us, but then the second quarter they scored the first basket, made it 30 17. Then the Celtics went on a 22 0 run spanning uh over a stretch of like seven and a half minutes where the Nets did not score. They yeah. just couldn't like dribble the ball into the lane, they could not penetrate our defense. Um, Unreal defense, like some of the best you've seen all year, the way we were locked in, um, and then just cleaning up the glass, getting every rebound on both ends, um, and then again, more just pushing the pace, ball movement. Um, it was awesome to see, and I mean, a lot of that stretch in the second was with uh, our bench lineups, too. Like, they kind of built up the lead, and then Tatum and Porzingis came back in, at which point the Nets must have been like, Jesus Christ, like, how is this happening? <laughs> um, and it was a straight-up avalanche at that point. I mean, we got up. I think like 52 to 17 or something was the final count for that like run. And I mean, at that point, that was, that was all she wrote. It was never close again from there. Uh, basically just kept going that, I mean, that second quarter, you almost started to feel bad for the Nets at a certain point. Like it was that ugly, uh, some men against boys shit out there, pure domination. And then 
truly the second half, like there's really not even much to take out of it because it was just such a laugher at that point. Uh, they didn't even send Porzingis back out there. He just iced his ankle. Um, and, you know, the Celtics kind of pure cruise control, but not, you know, the Nets weren't getting any closer. So just an absolute runaway as much as you'll see. Uh, we've called a few of the Celtics bad losses, some like burn the tape games. This is almost like a reverse burn the tape game because it was just like <laughs> so easy and everything went so well that it's almost not yeah. worth watching because it's just like will never be this easy again. So again, combination, we played amazingly. Nets played really poorly. Um, we looked like we were kind of di- disappointed with the way they ended last night. The Nets looked like they gave us our best shot, knew they couldn't beat us. And um, this felt like it was a nice uh, a nice nooner, uh, one versus 16 game to start off the tournament with uh, the favorites look- looking to go on a run here. So that's kind of what it felt like as we now head into the All-Star break. Uh, yeah, uh, I kind of agree with that. There's not a whole, like we were talking a little bit before, we're like, I don't really even know what for, as far as recapping this game goes, um, you know, it was just kind of, <laughs> everything went, went really well. Um, yeah. I think the, we talked, we talked a little bit about, uh, Tatum and Porzingis getting it going early. Tatum had three early assists to, uh, Porzingis in the first quarter. And again, I think like once it, once you see things moving that smoothly and that easily, mm-hmm. um, it's again, you can kind of tell when the team is, is playing at a certain level and they, they had that all game. Um, yeah. A couple of those passes too that Tatum had to Porzingis were like beautiful looking assists, like oh my God. some real like uh, some nice like basketball porn type shit. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. But, one of the things we've talked obviously a lot all year, but it's I mean it, it's been on full display in this recent stretch for Tatum, and I mean especially tonight where he is just like taking that last step as a true playmaker, and he's out there. It's like he's the queen on the chessboard. Like he's the guy who can do any move he wants. He's completely controlling the game. It's Ooh, like I he has like no that urgency. Queen on the chessboard. It's like he has no urgency to score. Um, and I mean, I don't say he's like LeBron, but it honestly, is like LeBron esque, where he would start those games, and it's just like LeBron is just feeling this game out, like watching and just taking in everything that's happening. And it's like he's just a step ahead of everyone else in his head. And again, it was like he wasn't even looking to score. He was just like, here's the matchup. Boom, assist to KP. Um, and then the second half. When KP wasn't playing, it was like he had that same uh, thing going with Hauser. How many Hauser had a great game and really got going yeah. shooting? How many of those were off of just beautiful dimes by Tatum? Um, and again, just to think that Tatum has made this kind of almost casual like passing leap, where now he just gets like seven assists every night. It seems like uh, it's just like a normal game for him. And the way that yeah. he's running the offense and passing is is absolutely crazy. And again, he was just amazing tonight. I think Nick and I talked about it last night, but we saw it again tonight. Like he has absolutely mastered that play where he's dribbling to either side uh the double comes and he just whatever hand he's dribbling towards does the one-handed behind the back bounce pass it's like a perfect pass he didn't hit uh hauser for a three on one of those tonight and it's just like so money it's just amazing to see the passer and the playmaker he's become and how it's like he really doesn't care about scoring he's just out there like oh this is what the defense is giving me tonight perfect i will just attack that until they change and then they take that away sweet now i'll do this and then it's like him taking over and just scoring is like the third, fourth option. It's like, oh, you're taking everything else away? All right, fine. I'll just score on you myself. So um, hard to say enough about Tatum. And it really is crazy. I was looking around, like, the way the NBA has shifted. And it's like, go back in time. And, you know, you got a guy who's the best scorer, the best playmaker, and the be- arguably the best defender on it, by far the best team in the league. And he can't even get a sniff for, like, MVP conversation. But um, All right, so you just you just basically opened the box. I wasn't sure if we were going to get into it tonight. <laughs> it's a per time. So I, I think that we're at the point now where, like, I've been kind of, uh, like, okay with the fact that, like, like Embiid was sort of, the, obviously, the front runner. He's obviously out of it now. Um, yep. It sort of defaults to, like, joke it. So I'm seeing, like, uh, uh, SGA. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I, I don't – if it's not going to be Jokic, I don't see why, it like, it wouldn't be Tatum afterwards. And, again, I think it gets to a certain point. Like, usually when there's kind of, like, a little bit of a log jam at who, like, the top team mm-hmm. in the NBA are, like, it's kind of, like, a close – um you know, contests as far as like games going. I know that, you know, we're, we're a little bit past halfway. There's still things that can change, but like the Celtics have just such a huge lead <laughs> over like the next best team. And Tatum is the clearly best player on that team. So it is yeah. a little bit like, again, I was fine with it for a while because it's just like, whatever, it's, it's not really an award that we're thinking about. It's not really what our goal is. I think mm-hmm. guys like Embiid, it means more to them or whatever, but it gets to a certain point now where like, Yes, his stats aren't going to be, and I don't have his like season stats. I'm sure they're still probably they're still probably pretty good. I'd say like high twenties, um, you know, pretty up there for rebounds and assists, which is yeah, which is a great stat line, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like the best player on a team that's like now like four or five games ahead of every other team. So you know, a lot of times if, if there's you know a couple teams sandwiched, you go with a guy who's like the highest point getter of those teams. 
But at this point, I, I think it's it's got to be about winning at some point. So, you know, mm-hmm. he's the best player on a team that has, like, a massive lead. Again, <laughs> it's, see if that, I mean, if they finish this, if they say they finish the season, like, seven or eight games ahead of everyone else, like, mm-hmm. how, how do you not give the best player on that team the MVP? It doesn't make any sense. But he's still, like, this huge, like, he's behind all these other people, it seems like. He's I'll dropping. look up what he's dropping. But in the last draw poll, he was sixth, and that's obviously with Embiid out of the mix. So yes, yeah, he, does, he was, make, I think, fourth in the last one or fifth at least. So it doesn't make any sense to me why he would be, why he wouldn't mm-hmm. be. I, I get that there's a lot so, of other good players. I mean, on the I team, can explain the. If you want me to devil's advocate, I can obviously explain. Yeah, the let's do a little devil's advocate. Here. So I mean, the reason Jokic, SGA are the top two guys now. They're, I mean, first of all, their teams are basically neck and neck for the one seed in the West, which has been the far superior conference. That's part of it. I mean, there's a lot of better teams in the West than the East. So those guys are still in first place. It's not like they're not impacting winning. Both of them are the only all-star on their team. So I think that's the other side of it where people see, okay, you've got another all-NBA sidekick and you've got Porzingis and White who are borderline all-stars too. So that's the other thing is like, yeah, Tatum's good, but he's the best player on the team but not as by as much of a wide margin. He's got three other guys who are really good and can be the best player on any other night. Whereas Jokic, it's like this team take Jokic off the team and it's a friggin' lottery team. Like the Celtics take away Tatum, they still be a good, really good team. Um, mm. And then I mean SGA, you could say the same thing. His stats are absolutely ridiculous, um, and he's been amazing on defense too. So he's doing it on both ends for a team that's ridiculously young, um, and he's leading him. So like I'm fine with that one too. Um, Giannis kind of just again putting up stupid stats uh and t- dragging his team as Lillard hasn't been very good the coaching disaster he's kind of kept their record intact that's the argument for him um Kawhi honestly since the first month I think has arguably been the best player in the world um he's like the best Kawhi has looked maybe ever at least since like 2017 probably so he's up in the mix yeah. um and then Luca I mean the stats are just gaudy Luca's the one where I mean the Mavs I think are like a seven or six seed right now so that's the one where it's like all right at a certain point, yeah, I think you got to be winning a little more than that. Um, yeah. So, but I mean, I have... for the most part, like I, I was bringing it up more just how crazy it is that like there are that many good players. Like, I don't even think it's like ridiculous. Like, or Tatum should be outraged or anything like that. I just think no. it's more crazy that all these other guys are like. It's, it's more just how the game has changed. Again, like you said, twenty-seven, eight, five on a t- forty-three and twelve team, and he's like the best defender too. Like playmakers, not like we have a point guard who controls like all the stuff he's doing. It's just. You go back 10 years and beyond in the history of the NBA, and that was like an auto MVP almost, and now yeah. it's like you can't even Yeah, exactly. Sniff. And again, I'm not too concerned about like him winning. Like I'm not going to be upset if he loses it, right. but it's like I was just sort of thinking about it again. This was a game <laughs> where you had plenty of time to sort of be thinking about other things going on too. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, you know, if they're going to, you know, finish, you know, five or six games ahead of everybody, every other team, right. it's kind of like I don't necessarily need him to win it, but it, it does sort of – so yeah. I, 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 have it right, I have it right in front of us, so – Jokic is uh, minus 150, so he's the obvious favorite. Mm-hmm. SGA is plus 280. Mm-hmm. Giannis is plus 700. Yeah. Luka is plus 1,000. And those are all, the, all those, those four are all ahead of Tatum. Tatum's fifth in the, uh, with, this is on DraftKings. Um, free ad, shout out DraftKings. Let us know if you want to support, support the pod. Um, Jason Tatum's plus 4,000. I mean, yeah. I feel like that's worth at least a little something. Sprinkle a little something on that. Ah, no one's stopping you. No, you're right. But I mean, also, you look at the games right. played. No, it is. He's an Iron Man, like going out there every night, too. And the other thing is, like you said, I mean, they're focused on bigger things. Just look at tonight. Would you say he finished with 20 points, nine assists, seven rebounds? Like, how many players could have forced themselves there, back in? Or, yeah, he played, what, 28 minutes? Like, that's probably a game that's overall ending up hurting his stats. And he just looked like one of the best players in the world. Like, if you watch the game, Tatum was so far and away the best player on the court and looking like you know, one of the best players in the world. And yeah. people just look at the box score and be like, 29-7? Like, yeah, that's fine. I mean, Luca is they're playing the Spurs and playing from behind. And Luca will probably put up, you know, 50, 15, and It'll 12. Loss. And you'll be like, holy shit. Or a close win. But, I mean, again, like, and it's not even to take away from Luca. It's just more, like, difference and, I don't know. Everything that's going on. I'm sorry to take away from guys. Fuck it. (laughs) You want our respect. I think Luca's really the only one where you can nitpick and say he's not, like, absolutely leading a team to at least competing for, like, a one seed. Yeah, I have no idea why Luca's easy to pick on in that regard. I did just realize, looking at that top five, though, Tatum's the only American in that top five. Oh, yeah. Interesting. So, if if you want America, you're getting on the Tatum for MVP bandwagon. So, you can look at it that way. Um, Well, Kawhi. Kawhi's ahead of him. No, Kawhi's plus forty five hundred. 
Kawhi's. Oh well, he was. Maybe on the he's ahead of him in the straw poll. Yeah. Yeah. But Tim what is the straw poll? Is that like that's like like what it's they do a, in Iowa? Essentially, Tim Bontemps runs it. He reaches out to a hundred uh, NBA media guys, so it's like a pretty accurate uh, like indication. People who of, like, actually the vote in it. In a the... lot of them do. Like the votes rotate between the media guys every year. Like so, I think like the Boston Globe, for example, gets one vote, or or maybe it's like, like Boston beat writers. So they oh, all Jesus. switch it every year. Like one year, like Corrales gets it. One year, it's like. J. King or Jared Weiss from the Athletic, like they kind of rotate. Who? So I don't know who has it, like which yeah. year. But but the straw poll, I think, is a pretty good, like probably as good of a indication as you can get of what the voters would pick. So. Okay, well, Kawhi's from outer space anyway, so he doesn't count. Sure. He's that That's guy's like an alien anyway. He's sick, yeah. So yeah, if you love America, you love Jason Tatum for MVP. Mm-hmm. Uh, but That's yeah, fair. that was just one of the uh, you know those thoughts that kind of yeah. pop in when you're absolutely <laughs> destroying a team. Certainly, a fair little side tangent, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, um, but um, other but that other... was the way he was playing tonight. Had you thinking MVP style, and it was again the way he was. The, it's just the way he was approaching the game, and it seemed like he was could do whatever he wanted and was just making the right play time after time yeah. with nothing in mind. But like we're gonna and get the, the easiest basketball stroking too. It was good stuff. Really <laughs> yeah. good stuff to see. Yeah. Seriously. And then you uh, can kind of go down the line if you want to go from there. I mean, Porzingis, he sat last night. We were like 99% sure it was just the front of the back-to-back. But, I mean, after the weird, like, back injury thing, you never know with Porzingis. Yeah. Uh, he obviously looked fine, was getting right in their paint. You using that matchup, um, scoring inside, scoring outside, looked totally fine. I think he had 15-5, and five, only played the first half. Derek White looked like, you know, we haven't seen, I feel like, a D. White game like that in a while. Game like yeah, that. yeah, he's right, been very he quiet. Had it all going. And, uh, and look what the offense floated. is. They flow it. I'm telling you, we like yeah, the Derek correct. White. I think that that's like the the best like indicator of what kind of match. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, like, he's yeah. not he's not the goes. best player. Obviously, he's not the guy that like you know. But at the right. end of the day, if if he's yeah. putting up points like that, that mm-hmm. that's the number one sign because I feel yeah. like some of these games. And again, with this, I'm using quotes. If you're not watching on YouTube, I'm using quotes. <laughs> Like this slump that like this others have kind of mm-hmm. been in or whatever people have said, <laughs> it, it's kind of coincided with Derek White almost being a little bit more quiet offensively. Yeah. I don't know if it's the headbands that we that's something <laughs> to talk about too. Tatum yeah. and uh, Derek White both had some headbands on today. Yeah, um, it definitely looked strange, uh, but <laughs> I got yeah. used to it by the end. Yeah. If, yeah. if it's gonna have this impact, then I'm all for it. Right. Um, if headband well, think- White is gonna be doing that tonight. And I think part of, like, what you said, definitely true, like, this, a lot of times the Celtics seem to go as white goes, but I think it's, it's like, a much bigger indicator of the overall way we're playing, because I think that's, like, how white scores. So I think when we're playing good defense, it leads to pushing the ball, and white's usually the guy pushing the ball up the court, like, sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. Jalen White are the guys flying up the court, um, and then, again, that just creates early offense, that's when the ball gets moving around, and the ball is always just, like, finding Derek in the corner, at the elbow, at the top of the key for open threes, he's, like, the, always the last guy when the defense is rotating, who they can't rotate to, it seems like he's always the one getting that last shot, and then when he's got that confidence, he's got that first step, he's getting in the lane, uh, and hitting floaters, and that's, yeah. it's like, we haven't seen a lot of those lately, tonight, he was getting right into the lane whenever he wanted, hitting the floaters, and then getting the ball moving around, it's coming back to him, he's hitting those threes, so, when those are going, uh, again, it's like how <laughs> it's an indication of how the team's playing, and then obviously when he's playing like that too, you know, there's certainly some games I guess where we're playing like that, and he, his shots just off. But uh, yeah, I think for the most part, when we're playing like that, the ball is finding him. And a game and, like and a game like this score. where they are just like running up and down, it kind of does like open up, like it sort of like unlocks that like thing in like right. my brain. Where there's sometimes when he's coming up and he just has these like real quick pull up threes, and I'm sort of like, oh, what the heck? And then like if it falls, <laughs> obviously it's sick. When it does, it gets annoying. But then mm-hmm. you start to see in games like this when there's so much like moving up and down the floor, like what him being able to hit him like hitting that shot or at least taking that shot consistently mm-hmm. and like being good enough at it, like that you can tell like so many defenders when he's like pushing it, he starts right. to slow down and they start mm-hmm. to kind of panic and then he can just kind of go right by them. Like it is, yeah. That kind of was on full display. That little bit of right. like you know you're kind of playing the long game with that. You do those shots all year. People now eventually they they they're going to be coming up to meet him, and then he's blowing by guys again. You said the floater, the floater looked awesome. Um, we had a little bit. We had Eddie House on the call tonight, no scal. Um, so Eddie House was like, a, there was like a fun fun point, funny point in there too, where he was like almost like thinking out loud. He's like, oh man, he's like, I didn't really have a floater, you know. He was just kind of like, <laughs> yeah. like I felt much better yeah. like jump shooting. Like yeah. it, was, it was kind of funny hearing him sort of like. <laughs> and you hear know, Mike was like, like Mike was like, yeah, Eddie, I think we all know like what your cable is. <laughs> like, it's a good yeah, stuff. I thought, but, um, I thought uh, just as a quick aside, I was to, I liked having Eddie House on the call. That was good. A good. I thought he scale. did okay, um, but I think he's a lot more like vibes. I thought you actually missed a lot of stuff by Scal. Like another thing, the Celtics played a ton of zone, and he just like 
didn't nobody mentioned it which like obviously <laughs> i noticed you know you're gonna notice watching it but little things like that where it's like you have to be like all right scal would have pointed out that we were playing zone after like one discussion. <laughs> like yeah. little things like that and then i also thought especially like when the they're running out of stuff to talk no, no no love it love it um but then I th- when especially when the game was getting out of hand and there was like less to talk about he was kind of like grilling mike with like questions he kept being like what do you think of this and mike was like ah uh, Jeez. Oh like, well, yeah. He asked him. He's like, "You've watched Tatum like his whole career. Like, what do you yeah. think is the biggest?" It was just like such a hard question. He's like, "What do you think is like his biggest area of growth since like you started started watching him?" <laughs> Mike's just like, "Oh, Jesus Christ, man! Like every yeah. like he just got." Well, that brings you to my next question. What do you <laughs> think is Tatum's biggest area of growth <laughs> throughout his career I mean, this year? I thought Gorman did a good job answering it, and I think what yeah. I think it's even almost as like a rookie and early in his career, we could tell Tatum was going to be at least like a really good scorer. I think it is really the all around player where I think yeah. that was always the question. Like, is he going to get to one of these like top of the league type of guys who can truly do it all on both ends. And right now it seems like he's certainly yeah. flirting with that territory. If he's not like there, he's the on first, the, the first thing that came into my head when he asked that question was his defense. I think, um, but then Mike calls one at the rebounding. Like that, that's like crazy. But how that's much part of the rebounding defense, is the too. game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess I like that. Those kind of he's grown like seven inches too. <laughs> yeah, he's 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 a massive dude. But yeah, no, yeah, that I, I thought that that was funny. He was I, that was the exact question you mentioned. He was grown. I was like, that was a hard question, just <laughs> like on the spot, because it's like this... it's a question you have to kind of have like an explanation for, you know. So right. it's well, like... and it's like there's no short answer. It's not just gonna be like ah oh, passing. <laughs> and, like move on. Like, he you gotta that too. He, well, did right, mention, but... he, he did kind of list everything. To be he honest, did. well, right. But it's like you're setting him up. He basically has to say like a five minute answer, yeah. or it seems like he's just like ripping him almost. So yeah, that was kind of funny. But yeah, awesome Tatum game. Uh, you mentioned obviously Pritchard ended up being the leading scorer. A lot of that was late, but Pritchard was awesome tonight. It was one of those games, and he's another guy who thrives in these kind of fast paced, wide open games. Um, against a team like this, he felt right at home. And you could see it. He was confident. He was getting into the lane. He was scoring on a couple of, like, nifty little layups inside, some shots he doesn't usually take. And I think, you know, part of this goes back to the Nets. We talked about it before last night's game, how we just completely overpowered them with size. Uh, you could tell we were overmatched. Luke went in there. Luke was dominating during that 22-0 run, oh, run on both ends. He was, hustling, he was snatching every rebound on offense and defense. He had back-to-back insane blocks. Uh, he had a couple dunks. It was like – dominant big man play out of Luke. And again, I think that's just part of the size mismatch we have out there. Yeah. Um, Luke was born to be on mic'd up too, by the way. <laughs> oh my God. He's, Another awesome they, it Luke shouldn't even be, it segment. shouldn't even go to anyone else. It should always just be yeah. like, like, He's, Corn- like, well, you can't, I was going to say Cornette's corner, but that's a little bit, that's getting a little <laughs> bit too corner. close. We have to follow season assist there, but <laughs> it's gotta be like, it should just literally just be like hanging out with Cornette. Like, yeah. I don't really – we've had a few mic'd ups, and I feel like every time Cornette's done it, this is at least the second crushing time it. I can think of. Absolutely yeah. crushed it. That guy was born to play that, play yeah. the uh, mic'd up guy. Yeah, he, he had some great – it seems like a – seems just like a joy to hang out with and be around. Yeah. Uh, it seems like he's helping the vibes. You can see it. And on like tonight, he was just awesome. Uh, and on the – well, K- exactly. It was awesome. Like, hard to really knock, honestly, any of the players tonight, but I feel like a few of them deserve special praise. And I thought Pritchard and Cornette, I mentioned that huge run was a lot of the bench guys doing it. Um, And I we haven't mentioned we have Jordan Walsh getting his first, like, real run as part of the rotation. Uh, came yeah. in late in the first quarter. Uh, and then played the first few minutes of that second quarter. So he finished as a you know a nice high plus minus in short minutes. But those were like real minutes during the beginning of the game. I thought he looked definitely like he belongs, size, strength, athletic wise. Uh, defense was solid. He looked. He definitely lost track of where he was a couple times. Uh, one led to a basket, but then he had a couple nice steals. He had a chance to finish the steal, but just immediately got stripped by Schroeder. And then yeah, uh, they were running out on the next one, and Tatum set him up for what could have been a dunk, and he just completely smoked the layup. Um, so it seemed like a, like a little jittery, but overall, I mean, I thought he, he looked solid out there. Like he, yeah, he definitely I mean, doesn't look overmatched or like he doesn't belong. And again, size and athletically, like he's right there. I think he could at least you know be a really good defender. So I love that they're kind of. Mixing him in there, yeah. Why well, he, had the, he had the one play too, where he basically defended the guy to to going out of bounds. Um, mm. But he was definitely he was getting well, a little they bit call, hazed. Call but fouls on him, he's the yeah, he was getting hazed like by the rest for sure. Yeah. So those foul calls he was God. getting. But was it tough. is just it is kind of cool, just like the fact that like the people at the guard were so jazzed up about you know the Celtics <laughs> yeah. second round pick this this year's draft, just he getting some minutes solid. out there. But again, yeah, I thought that he looked. I thought he looked well. Uh, I definitely think you know. The speed of the game is way different than what he deals with in Maine, and yeah. that was definitely he. There's some adjusting to that. I don't know if this is something we'll see more because of the guys who shipped out, or if this is just a matter of once Tillman mm. and um, 
Well, you, you mentioned the other guy's not really going to play all that much, but once Tillman's in, like Springer, he'll I don't be know. on Walsh as well. I think Springer and Walsh could uh, Springer, Walsh, and Davison could be leading the uh, the Red Claws, the main law, main Celtics to a title this year. But yeah, well, so so to your point, you don't think that this will be to that point. You don't think it'll be very often we see him get these types of minutes. This is just a matter of the guys I mean, that are I think out. It's one of those things where he could, you know, if he keeps looking good, keeps earning chances like this. I, I love mixing it in when there is yeah. an opportunity like this. Like, why not? And if he earns more minutes, like, let's see what it looks like. You know, yeah. it can't hurt. I was just but... shocked that he was in the first quarter. It was crazy. Yeah, I mean, again, we cool. were up a lot, but, but still I, like, early. You know, we talk all year about like the regular season is for kind of experimenting, trying stuff, and that's. That's perfect. I love that coach. Last night before the All-Star game, you're a little bit shorthanded. Uh, hell, you know, Jordan, we're going to throw you in first quarter. Here you go. Like, I'm, I'm sure he probably told him ahead of the game, like, you're going to be in the rotation. But still, that's like a curveball. And, you know, here you go, rookie. Let's see how he handles it. Like, why not? It can't hurt. And if it did, he could have pulled the plug right away. But like I said, I thought he showed a couple of, like, rookie nerves, but overall held his own and looked like he belonged out there, which, again, when your team is winning by 40, it's, again, like, he wasn't supposed to go in when it was a blowout. It's not his fault. The game was already, like, a complete fault. But, but no, I, I, thought I he, mean, the first quarter wasn't, it. I mean, it, we were up by no, a lot, no, but it's still the first quarter, and oh, no, no, no. the fact so, that he so, got those so, minutes and trusted no, him that's, was crazy. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I'm just saying it was funny how it was, like, it was already, like, a non-competitive game, but not because, that's not why he was in, is uh, yeah. kind of what I was trying to say. But another thing, too, just about the Nets as we, you know, we haven't really talked about them, but I think, you know, as good as the Celtics played, as good as our defense was, you really saw why tonight, um, whenever we've talked about the Nets, it's been that they kind of have like all these good role players, but no one who's like the go-to guy. And you, you could never see that more clearly than tonight. Whereas like, they just, when the Celtics picked up their defense, they had no one who could break down the defense off the dribble. <laughs> like everyone wanted to it pass was... it around and they have guys who can catch and shoot. Right, but there's just no one who could drive the basketball. The only guy they have like that on the team is Cam Thomas, and we basically played him off the floor uh, on the other end, and then they just had a bunch of guys in there who, again, are used to being like not primary creators, and they just could not get anything going at all. They're basically just passing it around. No one was driving, and then eventually someone would have to force up a shot. Like I like said, I almost like felt bad. I was like, they need something. And it was honestly glaring, even from last night, missing Ben Simmons as much as we make fun of him. Like, they just needed someone who could handle yeah, well, the ball he, and, like, Didn't create. he say he was going to play both games, and then he just had enough last night? Yeah. He, yeah, I guess. I don't know. Me forgot Simmons. they were back-to-back games, and it was in Boston or something. I don't know. Like, but, <laughs> yeah, um, maybe he just forgot. He's like, oh, back-to-back. Like, <laughs> yeah. No way we're leaving here afterwards, right? Not going to be the Celtics again. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> No, but I mean, honestly, like, the fact that you could tell how much they missed even Simmons' like, ability to create offense, uh, again, yeah. they just well, yeah. nothing going for them, and we're forcing up shots, and they rely on, like, those heat check guys like Cam Thomas and Lonnie Walker, and if they're not hot like they both were last night, then it's like, Jesus, they don't have much. So, again, it's it's like the, the team is built perfectly. They just need, like, the two stars. <laughs> it's like the rest of the team is there. They just don't have the two guys who actually are, like, the all-stars. Yeah, Get those two just, guys on the door. And two really generational good. players away from right, being a very... Right. right. But the guys, like, 3 through 12 on the roster, awesome. They're set. They've got it all. But, good uh, for them. Yeah, it was on display. And, again, you see kind of the difference between tonight and last night. Uh, what a difference 24 hours can make, huh? Yeah. No, that was... <laughs> yeah. That was a really good game. Uh, just real quick, any concerns? Uh, you mentioned Porzingis out uh, with he or he didn't play the second half with the ankle. So originally it looked like they were saying back, but then it said he came up with ice on his ankle. Um, any concern, or is this he goes to the All Star break, dips in some salt water for a few days, and we're back at it? I mean, I don't think so. Any concern at all? Like again, I think I was wondering if the starters were going to play in the second half at all. Like there was obviously no yeah. need to really. Um, and I mean, again, the fact that we have these eight days off or whatever, I think probably contributed to that in both ways. Whereas with Tatum, I think he was like, ah, let's get him, you know, stretch him out a little. He's not going to play for a while. Porzingis, uh, you know, the opposite, like, why why have him out there? Why risk it? We're up by, I mean, what were they up by? 40 points at halftime? Yeah. Honestly, I still say there's some like, concern. Anytime it's anything with his, anytime I well, see ice on him, I get a little nervous. But... I guess that's fair enough. But the way it was, like, did any, nothing I don't think happened. He just played the whole first half and then just didn't play the second I half. I did see one play. Um... I can't remember exactly what it was, but it did look like he like a little bit came up a little gingerly, but then he played for a while afterwards. So I don't know. <laughs> All right. Level well, of concern, low, uh, low, yeah. low. Yeah, medium, I, I, I'm low almost heat. at. Yeah, I guess you're right. And so with Porzingis, everything's concerning, but I have almost almost as close to zero concern as I can have. Again, just kind of based on the way it all played out. All right. Um, today was also Joe Mazzulla's 100th career win. Mm-hmm. Uh, fifth fastest head coach to get to that mark, 100 wins. Yeah. Um, and only 37 I mean, losses. Only 37 losses. So, yeah, I mean, again, I think that 
me and you obviously agree on this. I think that uh, Missoula just for some reason is just kind of continues to sort of be a little wildly like underrated and kind of hated on. I know that with you know, part of that, I think is how the previous guy left and all that. And the fact that we went to the finals with him with um, email and stuff, mm-hmm. but I mean, I, I don't really know what, I don't know. I, I've become like basically all in on Missoula because I just think that it's like people think that he like, we almost need a more experienced coach. I almost feel like, the way he sort of talks about the game and views the game is kind of exactly what this team does need because I don't think it's a situation of managing a bunch of egos. I think it's more, which is like when you say you want to bring in like a big star power coach or whatever. I think that it's more like we need guys to almost just like calm people down and just sort of realize that like we are able to do this and that like everything, it, it that the whole mindset that he has, the way he, you sort of approach the interviews, it's almost a little Belichickian, I think in some ways. Like there's will be like dead that. serious and then it's like, you realize he's like joking. You're like, oh, like Jesus Christ! I didn't even know he was like capable of like humor. Um, oh, he's a funny guy. Yeah, so I'm 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 a, I'm a huge fan. I mean, obviously, the fifth fastest mm-hmm. coach to do it. You can't argue with those results. Hundred wins. Um, go ahead. What do you What do you got on Joe? Do you have anything to add outside of what I just mentioned? I mean, I think we've you know everyone kind of knows the deal with Joe. I just think one of the things you know he said people you know he takes a lot of shit. Kind of, I think that's kind of par for the course for any like brand new coach who takes over a really good team and is expected to win. I think if you go back and look at history, like it's probably hard to remember now, but go back and look at when, you know, Ty Lue first took over the Cavs, go back and look at when Spolstra first took over the heat, like when Kerr first took over the Warriors, all these guys who now we just look around and we're like, yeah, Oh, obviously those are like, you know, the best coaches in the league. But when these guys took over, like LeBron wanted Spolstra fired, like, multiple times and pat riley came yeah. down and supposedly had like a doors closed meeting with the three stars and was like we're not firing spolster like suck it up and play with them yeah um, who is it i think was it shaq that told the story that like spolster once like said to lebron like like do you have a problem with me and lebron like didn't say he's like we can call pat riley right now if you want i forget it was someone else <laughs> like i think it was like one of the inside the nba where spolster was literally like if you want we can call pat riley right now like it just like kind of like just like yeah. because i do remember when he first got there it was like right it was like his, I mean, he's a coach killer. It was his like goal to do that. But, sure. but this is, yeah. But I get what you're saying. It's kind of like, you know, at, at that, you know, I think like Missoula you is a guy win. who like in three or four years, if we win, win you know, yeah, w- right. a it's going to take a while. More than one. Suddenly yeah. it's like, holy shit, his style he's, is like. Exactly. It's, it's going to take a while thing. for him to get appreciated in retrospect. Because when you take over that team, and I mean, especially the circumstances he took over, they're coming off of finals. It's like, literally all you can do is win the finals or you're basically right like underachieved and people are gonna you know what i mean like it's just an impossible situation for him to come into and again if he wins it's like it will just be like well you took over a stacked team like you didn't have to do anything they won in spite of Mm -hmm. you blah 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 and if they lose it's like well the team's stacked it's obviously the coach's fault like the coach is an idiot so yeah again he's almost in like a can't win situation i think he's done obviously really really well and continues to grow and get better i mean i feel like it's night and day just even watching him from last year which well i was gonna say i almost consider this year is really his first year with the team because like as as soon as the season ended and all those other guys just fled to go with Ime, it's just kind of like imagine just spending the whole season coaching under those like circumstances where you just know that Mm -hmm. the guys who are there like aren't your guys like probably are looking at him because missoula wasn't the Ime guy probably look at him as like like oh of course Mm -hmm. they gave like the job to the guy who's you know not like part of like the the inner circle. So the and then the moves he made, the guys he brought in, it's just like I don't know. Just that there must be something there <laughs> if he's able to get those Charles. I'm talking about Charles Lee and San Cassell, two mm-hmm. guys who like. I mean, Cassell left like yeah. again. Dogs I mean, Van left. Gundy even for what it's worth. Bringing like, that, in, I mean, I don't know if that's Missoula or if that's no, more but like the fact upper, that he was willing to come in. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Just but I just think it's like there's got to be something there that people who really know. Yeah. I mean, Charles Lee's a guy that whose name gets thrown around as like a head coach eventually. I mean, Sam Cassell, I'm sure, sure would one day probably like to be a head yeah, coach. Yeah, lead coach assistants forever. for two of the best teams in the league. Yeah, for so, a long so time. for both of them to go from good situations, albeit ex- they were going through coaching changes, and and to come mm-hmm. to be like, this is where we want to go, and this is the guy we want to work for. Right, it's got to tell you something. So you know, yeah. well, we're, and I think we, to- we know ball, but those guys really <laughs> know ball. So it's kind of yeah. Like, well, and to take it a step further, too, and you mentioned how, you know, unfair kind of of circumstances last year were not only the way the guys left, but the way that, if you remember, like, the whole email situation happened right before the season. So it was mm-hmm. like the job was thrust on him. There was no off season, no training camp. And then, 
even beyond that, with the guys who left at the end of the season, don't forget Damon Stoudemire left in March to take over the Georgia Tech job. Yeah. So he lost one of his main guys right in the middle, like right as they were getting ready for a playoff run. And then obviously all the other guys left for Ime. They obviously lost Will Hardy and uh, right before the season to Utah too to become their head coach. So like the staff was absolutely depleted and Missoula was like almost the last guy standing and just took over the job, had no time to really prep or do anything he wanted. Yeah. This year he has a full off season. He's got his own guys. He can bring in more of like, run the team the way he actually wants to run it and yeah seeing it's like i think people watching from afar just are like oh like there's joe you know doing nothing what an idiot it's like yeah, no, well, this is, yeah it's like this that, is like, his last team year, now like, it feels like his team he was like he's almost trying last year i feel like he was trying to almost do what he thinks people think he yeah. should do and i feel to, like to this just, year like, he's just like up. he's just like yeah like this is the way i want to kind of operate and approach stuff yeah and it's been great and i just i freaking love that clip of him like jujitsu climbing all over the guy I made a gif of it. I couldn't. I tried to tweet it out today. I don't know. Twitter wouldn't let me tweet out that gif. I got to figure that out. Uh-oh. Elon, what's up with that? Uh oh. Blocking out some of my best gifts here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so 100 wins. Uh, what did you say? 37 losses? Yeah. 137. So, seems good. Yeah. Pretty good clip for sure. Um, is this 100th career win like, is this um, like including playoffs or just regular season? No. Wins? Okay. I, I don't think it's included. I'm no, pretty I don't sure think it's just it regular season. That would, yeah, that would, those numbers don't add up. <laughs> um, all right, so yeah, shout out Joe. Um, Definitely. Do you have anything else just on this game, or do you want to kick it over to around the NBA? Um, no, I mean, I, there's not much more to say about this game. I mean, just like I mentioned, my keys going into the game were basically just to like not have that like last second letdown before the long vacation that you know it's so easy to slack yeah. off that Friday before break or whatever, and like the Celtics. <laughs> Did the opposite of that pretty much. So, I mean, to go out, get that kind of, like, momentous win to carry into the break, and that's that's kind of the taste they leave in our mouths as they are, as we have to go, you know, eight nights without them is, is pretty good. And, you know, if tonight had been a, you know, again, if a loss tonight, it's not like it would have changed anything in the grand picture scene, mm-hmm. but it just would have been annoying to uh, yeah. <laughs> no, on that take, one for a couple that's weeks. A shout out the coach and had the guys ready for the game tonight. Absolutely. Um, all right, so, yeah, go ahead. What do you got for us? Uh, what's going on around the league? Uh, someone got punched in the face. Didn't have to do with Draymond. Are you going to open with that, or did I just steal your thunder there? <laughs> uh, well, we like can a opening story. That's yeah, that's the one that came in. Not Draymond, but honestly, if you get if you if I said the list, you know, the five most likely guys to punch someone in the face, uh, he'd be right there, almost neck and neck, I think, with Draymond. Of course, that's Beef Stew as a historic of the Detroit Pistons, uh, famous psychopath. Um, and the reports came out today that in the I think it was like in the tunnel or outside of the locker rooms before the Suns Pistons game, which is I think just started going on now. Um, that Drew Eubanks of the Suns and Isaiah Stewart were kind of getting face to face, getting mouthy, whatever, going back and forth, just kind of talking. And Stewart then basically just absolutely rocked him in the face. Um, police are involved. The Sun released a statement oh. that they're, they're just like this is just like a dangerous, violent, criminal situation, and they're cooperating the with Sun law enforcement. Yeah. Oh, that's narcs. That's bad. Yeah, I mean, it didn't seem great. Um, so, Come on. It, it, so he said, the Suns spokesperson said, the attack on Drew Eubanks was unprovoked and acts of violence such as this are unacceptable. We unequivocally support Drew and will continue to work with local law enforcement in the NBA. <laughs> okay, hold on. Let's break that down a little bit more. The First of all, the first <laughs> sentence is almost word for word, I feel like, the George Bush 9-11 like, response. Like, it wasn't, all right, it's, it's a little much. And then we'll continue to support Drew. It's just like, okay, well, yeah. like. Were they about to like throw him, like, <laughs> like, like honestly like we're, our guy was waiting. kind of being a dick anyway like <laughs> he said through. shit yeah like, he, like <laughs> what he said like he kind of was asking for this guy to crack yeah him. Like, so we so continue like, to support uh, him <laughs> support him yeah like he's going through like some like <laughs> yeah. turmoil like, yeah it's um, like is it yeah they're right. not gonna like just throw him under the bus but yeah, yeah shouldn't have been we're talking all there. shit we're all there for true like yeah. <laughs> shouldn't have been talking like son's official statement is like shouldn't have been talking shit and he's our guy but. That's Sons of statement. Like, Drew walked around and he found out. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look, we like um, him. He's our player. We pay him. Yeah. But the guy was being a total can't, asshole. Can't support him on this one. Yeah, no, he's yeah. being a dick. Uh, Dwayne Rankin, who covers the Suns, also tweeted out. He said, I asked Drew, Banks about, Drew Eubanks about the incident with Isaiah Stewart. Said he was heading to the locker room inside Arena when stopped by Stewart. Had words and Eubanks said Stewart sucker punched him. Security intervened and he's fine. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, I love that it was great before story. the game, too. That's, you, yeah. 
you and rarely Stuart, see the before Stuart's game. injured and has, by the way, too, I should point out, and hasn't been playing for a long time and was not going to play tonight. <laughs> so <laughs> that I have no funnier. idea, like what. That definitely makes it know. funnier. Yeah, got to find out what happened, what the history is. But like I said, Stuart is a known psychopath, so. Um, yeah, not really shocking that it involved him. And then yeah, he's like it to this for point. people who don't know, he's the guy who there's like that gif of like the guy bailing through like 50 people on the NBA floor to try. He was trying to get to LeBron, but it's yeah. like a pretty famous like it's like a pretty popular gif. He got elbowed in the face, was bleeding all over the place, and he was yeah he was willing to go through everyone to get to LeBron, uh, his teammates, his security, everyone. Uh, so yeah. yeah, he's 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 crazy. Not so definitely on the short list of like guys you don't want to fuck with yeah, in the NBA. Saw, For uh, guys who are not like, hold me back, guys. He's like, uh, no, he's about You can't it. hold him back either. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, he's um, very much Shout out to the Worldwide Wob, Rob Perez. He had a funny tweet that was like, some like uh, Suns Stadium security guy is about to make the easiest 10K of his life just getting that like security footage and leaking that out. Mm. So that will be awesome to see. We're definitely, yeah. I mean, we're definitely going to end up team. seeing it. Yeah. If, if the Draymond Pool punch came out, how does this not come out, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that'll be a good one. I mean, that, that was in a closed door practice at the Warriors facility, and that mm-hmm. still leaked out. So uh, I think it's safe to say we're. It's hopefully only a matter of time until this one sees the light of yeah. day as well. Um, and that, hopefully that it's statement equally was hilarious. great. I'm glad you had that statement ready. That was good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that really ties it all together. So uh, good to see the Suns aren't throwing the guy who got knocked, knocked in the face under the bus. <laughs> I'm so happy they're supporting him. <laughs> That's really, really good to know. It's really good to hear what an organization that is. Uh, so. Funny stuff, but anyway, uh, elsewhere in the NBA, had some other interesting story that the Clippers had to send home P.J. Tucker and Bones Highland uh, from their last road trip. <laughs> two guys who have not been in the rotation and were pretty vocal about wanting to be traded. Obviously, we're not, um, and I don't know exactly what happened, but when the team has to send them home, that's usually not good. So, I don't know if they were just, you know, missed the curfew or out partying, being insubordinate, uh not really sure, but uh, yeah. getting set all the week, the week after Super Bowl in Vegas, uh, something's up. Yeah, yeah it's right. interesting for a team that has had you know almost all positive stuff since the first few weeks of the season. It's been yeah. you know haven't been too many uh, knocks on anything from there. So for something like that to come out for a true contender is at least like a little bit eyebrow raising. So Tucker like, why, too, I mean, why don't the Clippers? Why don't they just like spy him out or something like that? Is that like? Like they're they've well, been really good and he's non existent and he just seems to be just like an asshole. Well, not yeah, I shouldn't say uh, asshole. I mean, just like so Tucker has <laughs> because of the awful contract he signed in Philly. He has an he has eleven and a half million I think this year, and I want to say it's a team op, uh, player option next year for about the same. So that'd be a lot of money to eat. Um, they'd, they'd like to have my would think as an expiring next year. I try to do something with him. Highland also has another year left, and I think the Clippers are so. They're going to be so screwed so soon with this new CBA, and they're going to have so little wiggle room that I just don't think they can really like afford to do that. Whereas Highland, I, I mean, it, it, I don't know if he still does, but he at one point had at least like they probably could have moved him for a second rounder for like the upside. Um, mm-hmm. And then Tucker, I would think at least next year, like maybe could help a contender, but you'd think you'd hope you could at least trade these guys to like keep the salary slots, get salvage anything. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. We'll see. So they said that they're going to rejoin the team after the all-star break. So if something else happens, then maybe they'll be like, okay, this is, we're trying to win a championship. Like we can't have these guys around. Uh, I don't know. But like I said, just uh, kind of a weird story. And again, DJ Tucker, say what you want about him, but he's, he's definitely like a true veteran professional player. So I think Highland, you know, could have, if you just told me it was bones, I'd be like, yeah, there could be some immaturity things there. But uh P.J. Tucker, that's a little concerning. He's supposed to be, like, usually a guy you'd think would be, like, a rock in the locker room, even if he's not playing. Um, you'd think you'd want to be a part of that veteran team and, like, win a championship, so. Like yeah, I, said, I don't know. Maybe nothing, but a little bit eyebrow-raising, at the very least. Um, I mean, yeah. Else... Right. We don't need to get to it in P.J. Tucker. <laughs> yeah, no, right. Um, elsewhere, I thought, uh, interesting stories kind of always, like, leak out after the deadline about things that, like, didn't happen but almost happened. I thought there were yeah. a few interesting ones this year, uh, kind of involving LeBron. The first one was that the Warriors made, like, a legit push to trade for LeBron and try to convince the Lakers that they're, like, have no future with LeBron and they should trade him to pair him with Curry, um, which obviously would just be, like, absolutely wild. Who knows how close this one's happening. And then the other rumor that came out was that the Sixers were... Their, their big moves this were trying true. to also trade for LeBron and to trade for Durant, which is just, like... No, Classic, wasn't there more teams? Daryl there was Morey. more teams than that, didn't they? I no, those they are the re- top of the list. Yeah, I, I don't know who else. All Hold on, were, I gotta but, find uh, the tweet on that. Go ahead, keep going. But yeah, it's just, um, I mean, this is classic like 
Daryl just being like, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I don't know why he doesn't get the same shit that Danny Ainge used to get for being like, you know, this is like the most, Danny Ainge would always get ripped on like after the trade being like, oh, we were so close. Like, you know, we were the second ones in the running or whatever, this and that. And it was always like, y'all so close to making the big trade. Whereas like Maury loves to just sit there and be like, oh, like we only go for stars and like, oh, we're keeping some open for cap space. We're not doing this. We're not doing that. And then to come out and be like, yeah, like we were almost, we were in on LeBron and KD. And it's like, give me a break like just please just like shut up so um maury's clown the six hundred clowns the yeah, warriors i can't find I mean, the tweet but i feel like the, he reached out to like it was like four teams was like someone was like like the guy he thinks he's playing like nba 2k or something like that like with some <laughs> right. of the, the amount of people that he was reaching out to like yeah it was hilarious yeah, no it's crazy maury is out of his mind um so that was just funny not like a real story but kind of a story worth mentioning i thought and hilarious also on the on the heels of uh the report from mark stein saying that multiple teams think that if they draft brawny uh they can convince lebron to join their team this offseason so <laughs> it'll be a fun uh fun offseason for sure especially if the lakers you know go down in flames and lebron really does start to think about moving so that would be exciting also uh live update in the middle of around the league, I'm now watching uh, with mute. But Kristaps Porzingis at the podium answering questions and smiling. I think it's probably safe yeah, to say this. I got eyes in the same. Certainly thing doesn't here. look like anything uh, too concerning. On Looks the like a guy who's just there. ready to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Go on yeah. vacation. Oh, yeah. yeah, and I mean that was his response when asked about the if he was mad about missing the All Star game. He said, "No, I'd." Rather go somewhere uh, warmer and work on my tans, get the time yeah. off. So that's what you want to hear. Um, and then elsewhere in the NBA, uh, uh, we've kind of had a couple silly stories involving the Suns, I guess. But this is a good story. When Matt Ishbia, the new owner, took over, uh, he kind of said all the right stuff that he wanted to do to make them just like – he basically said he was willing to spend in any way possible to make them like a better organization. And he's seemingly following through on that as they officially have now a G League affiliate team. Um, and also in classic – They didn't have new- that before? No. The Suns um, just didn't have a G League team? Right. I thought that every team had a G League team. No, there's only like 24 teams, I think. Really? So There's not there's not as many G League teams as NBA teams. It's getting closer now, but they're... Uh, yeah, that's cr- I thought that every stuff. team had one. So some teams just don't have guys they can call up? They do, but they're not like Good. on their team. They have certain guys playing on like other teams. There's different teams, and there's a couple G League teams. There's like G League Ignite and stuff, who's not affiliated with any team. So right. it's kind of weird, but huh. yeah. The more you know. But anyway, so that's cool. Good story. Uh, and then being well intentioned as Ishbia is, and wanting to win over the fans, he made a mistake, as I'm sure he'll soon learn, and opening up the name of this G League team to fan voting. So, Ooh. fans out there, uh, go ahead and let's see what we can. Also, we don't know the results uh, yet. I don't know. I, I didn't. I'm sure there's. He probably put in options and made it more limited. Uh, but I still just think it's funny that uh, this this never ends well. <laughs> the way that people hope it's going to end when they do a like a good spirited idea that should be fun for the fans and will end with you know whatever. Bodie McBoatface. Bodie, That's yeah, like Bodie the classic McBoatface. one, right? Name like right. the na- new Navy boat or whatever. Bodie yes. McBoatface. Exactly. <laughs> so, oh uh, wow! Team, yeah, team Mimic team face is right there, right there for this team. <laughs> but, That's incredible. Yep, good stuff. Um, and then that was really all I had. A ton of games going on tonight, but uh, we got in here pretty early, so nothing really to dig into as we creep towards the All Star break. I figured we should probably make uh any All Star weekend thoughts. Obviously, we got JB in the dunk contest. Uh, pretty star studded three point contest. The actual game itself. Sunday night, Jason Tatum defending MVP of the All-Star game. Uh, any All-Star weekend thoughts, predictions, emotions? Uh, I mean, I hope, they, uh, hope the dunk contest doesn't suck. Uh, I think with just Tatum, with Jalen in there, I think that it'll obviously be fun. But I think Mike mm-hmm. kind of said it too in the broadcast today where it's like, I don't know, he's not – he's not as – like he's a guy who will just absolutely hammer it down your head and like bury you. But I don't know. I'm interested to see how he does kind of just like on like the kind of flash and pizzazz side of it because – you know, he also does just seem like a really reserved guy anyway. So I'm hoping that he kind of just like goes out there and does something cool. I'm expecting him to do, um, is it, uh, who's the guy? D, D, uh, War 7, was it the dunk we didn't look? D Brown. D Brown, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, yeah. We already had this discussion. Same last name. Yeah. Uh, no, but I, I think Jalen, I think people are forgetting how <laughs> sick of like pizzazz type dunks he can do. I mean, I've, I was watching some of the highlights when this came out. He can do, you know, the windmill, the through the legs, the 360. I'm pretty sure he can whip up something pretty cool. So uh, 
I'm not really worried about that. I'm excited to see uh, if, you know, Tatum's out there helping him, what kind of they can just like what creative stuff they can come up with. But uh, I, yeah. I mean, I think if, I think if he lands his dunks, he'll win. And I think if the NBA is smart and Adam Silver is smart, they will make it so that if it's close, I hope that the judges will give him the win. Because, again, they this is on Brown almost to like save the dunk contest. If he goes up there and loses and everyone just clowns at him, it's like, Oh, you lost to G leaguers. Then well, then no, no one's star ever, yeah. is ever going to want to do it again. Right. Mm-hmm. So if he goes up and wins and everyone is hailing him as like the hero who made Duncan cool again, then I think it'll open the door for other young players to be like, shit, like I can do that. You know, maybe Anthony Edwards and John Moran and guys like that are like, Oh, like this guy who made all NBA and you know, is, paid as he'll ever be multi-time all-star like he's going doing it and making it look cool and he's out there dominating and like it's again i think it's as much as it's tough for brown it, it is an opportunity i think for him to grow like his popularity and like a national start of level so you know he can have like an iconic vince carter type of dunk contest moment out there like that could be huge for his personal brand as a star and yeah. you know like i don't really care about that personally but i would be happy for him i think it'd be well deserved and i think that could also like pave the way for to kind of bring back the dunk contest and make it cool again for stars to do it. Yeah, no, that is a good point. If he doesn't win, then no, there's no, it's, they, <laughs> there's no stars going to do it. Because right. it is a tough, tough spot for him. Because if he does he win, it's win. like, he just beat a bunch of G-leaguers. If he yeah, doesn't it's win, like, it's cool, it, dude, you could be Mac a bunch of so. <laughs> I'm excited to see that, though. Yeah. Um, I mean, no, the All-Star just... Game, I'm excited to be back to the East and West format. I think that'll be a little bit mm-hmm. interesting. The All-Star Game, though, I mean, I'll be honest, it just kind of... Do they still do, like, the crazy, weird scoring due in the fourth quarter? So, bullshit? no, they got rid of that, which I hate. I love... I thought the Elam ending was the coolest part of the game because then it got... It actually got intense when they were trying to get to that target score at the end. Um, yeah. So, I'll miss that. I thought that was by far the best part of the game. I don't know why they got rid of that. Because um, no one understood what the fuck was happening. Probably. I mean, I think it couldn't be simpler to understand. I think we could go for a long time arguing about if the NBA should go to the Elam ending for the end of every game. Like, I think it's a way better way to end a basketball game than with, like, free throws and stoppages and this and that. What was it again? So, like, if they whatever lead they had... It was it's like just first... a target score. So you can do it... out The way that they do it in usually competitive, like, tournament-style games is basically um, when you get to the final two or usually it's when there's like two or four minutes left in the game the clock goes off and then you add eight points to the team that's leading score so say the score is 64 to 60 you know the celtics are winning then there's two minutes left you turn the clock off and now it's first team to 72 wins interesting yeah i guess that was kind of cool i guess i don't know i feel like there was other shit there was other shit with like the quarters and stuff like that i don't know i don't know well, well, the so also game was, is that was just for charity. That was each quarter, like each quarter was its own game in that that like what was representing a charity. So it was like yeah. the East won the first quarter, so they their charity wins X amount, and then like at the end, I don't know. That was kind of dumb, but I know it was all just to like a way to stack money for charity. So I can't really hate it. Yeah, yeah, we support charity. Shout out. Charity. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we look yes, exactly charity. <laughs> Shout out charity, big charity fans <laughs> yeah. here. We're very charitable. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, the NBA, like, an all-star game is an all-star game, I guess, at the end of the day, but I feel like of all the all-star games, I mean, I think the NBA is the best, because I think it just caters towards, like, players going out and doing cool shit, and it's, yeah. you know, like, you can't really have a football all-star game or a hockey all-star game, because either, you either are trying on defense and you hurt someone, or you're not trying on defense, and it's, like, completely unwatchable and doesn't even resemble the sport. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, basketball, you can at least kind of try to, like, not play defense and still, like, play offense, and sometimes, you know, in the fourth quarter, at least, is, like, it used to be cool in the fourth quarter. It would Then it would be, like, okay, these are the guys who actually think they're, like, the best of the best trying for the last few minutes to win the game. So that was always fun to see, like, mm-hmm. who is the guy who's, like, okay, I'm the alpha of the alphas. Like, give me the ball, I'm taking over, type stuff. Uh, so, you know, getting something like that is always cool when they actually start to care and go back and forth. Who knows if we'll see that. Um, but, you know, if you like seeing 400 points scored in a game, then this will be the game for you. Hit the over, yeah. Um, all right, well, we're, uh, yeah, so we're heading into a little bit of an all-star break ourselves. We'll still have some uh, stuff going up on the blog. Make sure you check it out at chuddyscorner.com. Um, we got a couple good blogs up there. The power rankings will still be out on Monday, right? Nothing changes that. Um, no, of course not. Maybe yeah. sooner, since there are no games before then, so we'll That's see. That's true. We could do the power rankings. Like, yeah, but either way, check the blog. Out. We're going to have all the episodes, catch up on old episodes, Yeah. Um, catch up on some of those older blogs. You had a great one out there, too, for potential buyout market options for mm. the Celtics. Yeah. Some um, of those guys a still lot out of positive there. Positive feedback on that. So, um, yeah, make sure you check it out, chuddyscorner.com. 
Uh, make sure you're following the the show page at Chuddy's Corner on Twitter, on X. Uh, make sure you follow <laughs> me at Doug underscore outs. Make sure you're following him at King Chuddy. Um, and go ahead and hit that like, subscribe button, whatever you're, whatever platform you listen to the podcast on. Um, and then go to any other uh, podcast platform and do the same thing on all those ones too. Check out the YouTube page, all the good stuff. Chuddyverse, uh, it's been a great little before first half of the season so far. I can't believe how mm-hmm. far we are in the season that we've just been doing this the whole season so far. But looking forward to ed- ending strong and heading into the playoff push. So Chuddy, enjoy your all-star break. Work on your tan. Enjoy yourself. I will see you. Take care. Peace out, Chuddy Eds.